Jackson Love. I am Sustainability Program Manager for Shorenstein Realty Services, a real estate company based here in the Bay Area. Um, I am responsible for Shorenstein's corporate responsibilities, sustainability efforts, and I'm also a member of the ULI Sustainable Development Committee here in San Francisco, which is hosting this event. Um, when I suggested the idea nine months ago of organizing a program on sustainability reporting, uh, I remember looking around the room, my colleagues on the committee, and getting a few looks that said, are you sure a reporting program is going to get any people in the room? <laughs> but here you are. Uh, we got a great turnout tonight. Uh, you even made the walk all the way from the BART station, like 10 blocks away. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you realized you'd have to make that walk coming out here. But thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we have an incredible panel here. I am honored to have been able to assemble these folks in the room with us. And I'll let Heather introduce them in a few minutes here. But um, just to kind of set the framework, I wanted to talk about what we are talking about, what we aren't, what we aren't talking about. So sustainability or corporate responsibility has evolved and grown in importance over the uh, last several years. Um, we are seeing in the real estate industry, increased interest from um, investors, from tenants or occupiers, and from local governments and communities uh, wanting to know what um, companies are doing on sustainability. Uh, are their buildings being operated efficiently? Are they making the right sort of investments <coughs> that make these uh, assets sustaining performance for the long run? <clears throat> um, and are they at the, the corporate <clears throat> level, which is what we're really focused on here, uh, do they have the right <coughs> governance mechanisms in place? Are they good uh, corporate citizens in the community? And are they making reasonable efforts to improve the environmental performance of the buildings that they develop and operate? <clears throat> So we're not going to focus on LEED or Energy Star or the asset level rating systems. We're really going to focus on, at the corporate level, disclosure uh, programs that, uh, frameworks that have emerged as, uh, as being specific to the real estate industry um, or more broadly to uh, many industries, uh, GRI, Cresby, et cetera. And, um, my notes. Uh, so I am um, going to introduce Heather now. Heather Yadno, did I get that right? Yes, good Is the Director of Sustainable Building and Construction for ThinkStep, a global software data and services firm that helps organize, uh, helps organizations succeed sustainably. She's a seasoned strategist with over a decade of experience developing and leading international product marketing, business development, and product development in, uh, initiatives for startups and large, large multinational organizations focused on the intersection of sustainability, technology, and the built environment. Clearly a great resume. Um, she actually came on to the panel as our moderator last Friday because our original uh, moderator, Claire Bonham Carter, actually had to be on a business trip in Mexico tough place to have to go for a business trip, so we aren't holding it against her too much. But Heather has stepped on, she has great credentials. Uh, when I talked to her on the phone, she knew exactly what I was talking about, GRI, Cresby, CDP, so instantly I knew I had a great uh, stand-in. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to her and let her introduce our panelists. Thank you. Yeah, I've done my fair share of work on these different rating systems, both buried in Excel spreadsheets and software tools. So. I was delighted when Jackson called and asked if I could help moderate the panel, so thank you, and thank you for pulling this together. Um, as Jackson mentioned, I'm Heather Gadno of ThinkStep, formerly known as PE International. I just want to put that out there. Some of you may have seen the brand change. Uh, it happened last Friday, so we are the same company, but uh, we do have a new updated look and feel. 
Just a few housekeeping items before we get started, take you through the flow of the evening. We're going to have five minutes for each presenter and then dig into a question and answer session that will last about 20 minutes. From there, we'll take questions from the audience. So please jot down your questions and your remarks. We look forward to an engaging dialogue with all of you um, after we get through the initial presentations from our speakers here. I just want to get a gauge of who's in the room. So how many folks do we have in the room that work at the investor level? How many investors? Okay. And how about developers, builders? Great. And property managers or asset managers? Uh -huh. Sustainability consultants? Excellent. And I know this audience typically is not geared toward the product manufacturer, but sometimes there's one peppered in here. Is any? Yeah, there you are. All right. Knew there had to be one. <laughs> so we have a pretty strong representation of the entire built environment value chain in the room tonight, which is uh, very exciting because as you think about corporate sustainability reporting, the information that you're gathering really focuses not only on the company level, so your energy usage, your water usage, your governance structure, but oftentimes looking at the supply chain is a really core component of pulling together any sustainability report. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Kristen. Kristen Sullivan is a partner at Deloitte & Touche, and she leads Deloitte's Sustainability Assurance, Reporting, and Compliance Services, working with clients to help address their sustainability and disclosure needs. Kristen brings extensive experience in sustainability reporting and assurance focused on social impact. Kristen leads Deloitte's effort around social impact investing, specifically focused on Deloitte's services in support of the Global Impact Investment Rating System, or GEARS. She also serves as a member of the Global Reporting Initiative, GRI, that's an acronym that you'll see throughout the evening, so embed that one to memory. And um, she's on the Sustainable Accounting Standards Board, which is another acronym, SASB, uh, Assurance Advisory Council, the Integrated International Integrated Reporting Council Working Group, and the Global Initiative for Sustainability Ratings. With that, I'll hand it over. Thank you, and good afternoon. I'm just gonna stand up because I can see my slides a little better here. But thanks everyone for being here. I'm really thrilled to be here, especially on such a lovely day in San Francisco. It's not quite this lovely in New York, so great to be here. So this chart's gonna probably be a little bit difficult for some of you to see, but what I'm gonna do is just speak a bit to just the broad market forces, the marketplace, what's happening in corporate disclosure as Jackson teed up a number of initiatives that are really driving this enhanced reporting, an expectation by the marketplace that investors and others are looking beyond historical financial reporting and really trying to understand what are those other non-financial value drivers largely covered under this umbrella of environmental, social, and governance factors that really are influencing future financial performance and just sustainability of organizations. So what this slide presents is clearly we have established financial reporting. And I realize that all of you in the, in the room are, are, don't play in the public company space, but, but it's, it's more of a, just an illustration in terms of where reporting is heading. When you look to the right, the, the non-financial reporting landscape, this landscape is evolving rapidly. There's, there's a number of initiatives. It's the alphabet soup of, of the standard setting and reporting initiatives that, that represent um, drivers of the supply of data to the, to the marketplace. So standard setting initiatives that are looking to advance standardization, transparency, consistency of reporting of information under this broad umbrella to the marketplace. So that's where we've got the Global Reporting Initiative, the, the, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, among, an, uh, among several other initiatives. These are just illustrative. Then you've got on the demand side, what are the initiatives that are really trying to, to spur the demand for this information? Investors talk about the interest in this, this form of information as critical to decision making in terms of really evaluating an organization's performance, but the absence of consistent and standard and, and comprehensive and accurate information is really you know, serving to, to perpetuate what's called this information gap in the marketplace. So you've got the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, CDP, um, the Global Initiative for Sustainability Ratings, and then we're going to drill into what does all of this mean, excuse me, from 
from an industry perspective, that's what you're all interested in today, right? The, you know, how does this impact the real estate industry and how are some of these develops, developments really um, serving to, to not only reflect the expectations of the marketplace, um, but ultimately will become more de facto expectations. So um, clearly SASB, their whole premise is industry specific standards and disclosures. The Global Reporting Initiative has, has a sector supplement that helps guide an organization within the, the real estate sector. We know it's a, it's a broad definition in terms of the players. Um, and then we're going to speak a little bit more uh, later this afternoon, this evening, around the role that, that Gresby, or Gres, uh, from the, the European definition, <laughs> the uh, traditional American de definition, and uh, speak a little bit to ULI Greenprint. This slide just illustrates there's a number of, in, under this concept of materiality, you know, what is important? When you think about materiality in the context of non-financial reporting, it's really the subject matter. What are you reporting and why? And your audience, to whom? And who cares about it? And what would actually influence their decision in terms of how you go about collecting, analyzing, and reporting that data? Some recent research that came out just focusing on the, the, the top key sustainability topics reported in the, in the real estate sector. I know we'll speak a little bit more about that um, as, as, we, as we move through, and I only have five minutes, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that. As far as just, again, under this, this kind of stage setting of the broad landscape and, and the evolving landscape, what, what's really motivating organizations throughout the marketplace to, to disclose? Clearly there's, some very well understood drivers in terms of just how this whole landscape is evolving. Transparency, whether you're a public company or, or, or playing in a, in a private setting, the expectation by stakeholders for information around how you're creating value is critical. Um, from a competitive risk mitigation perspective um, and branded reputation, a lot of I think the evolution of sustainability reporting has, has emerged and really evolved based on this, this expectation, this, this kind of, you know, trying to meet external stakeholders' expectation, and it's moved to kind of a compliance mindset. I think increasingly companies are seeing the, the value that, that the, this type of activity, and you, you, don't, you can't measure what you don't, you can't manage what you don't measure. So really looking at the, the, the culture, the reputation, the, the ability to just really um, create value uh, through, through this form of reporting. Clearly, public companies are, are exposed to extra uh, expectations and, and uh, in terms of the, the, the nature of, of the public uh, markets. And private companies more so have the opportunity to, to use sustainability as the real value play, right? Like demonstrating the value as an organization and, and helping that, or, so that can help to serve as a differentiator. And then just a, a minute on this concept of assurance. So, <coughs> The term is largely misunderstood in, in, this, in this landscape, but I think that the point being, and we'll talk, I think, a little bit with, with the uh, other representatives on the panel, the fact that if you're gonna report this information and there's an increase in the supply of this information to the marketplace, increasingly sophisticated users of this information want to make sure that it's reliable, it's accurate, it's complete, it's needed, it's, it's actually going to inform a, a, a decision. And so we see a movement towards, and we clearly operate in the space, we're a professional assurance provider, around the increasing demand to you know, demonstrate commitment that, that you've reported, you've put all of this effort into a communication to stakeholders. It's reliable, it's credible, it's accurate. Um, and, and just a number of areas where, where um, assurance on this sustainability reporting increasingly has added benefits to companies that generally think this is just something to tack on to the exercise that I, that I go through, but it, it actually serves to, to identify opportunities where perhaps processes and controls could be improved and, and actually the company can find greater value. So it's not just kind of to meet an additional external stakeholder expectation, but really there's a tremendous amount of value that, that, that organizations can find from obtaining assurance. So I'm gonna pass on the uh, the, the clicker here, and we look forward to questions at the end of the session. Thank you. You know, you really touched on a few important points there. Um, when we deal with clients implementing software to track a lot of this metric data and, and report on these informations, we really talk about four key factors. Mitigating risk, 
improving brand value, decreasing cost, and increasing revenue. So as, as you start to deal with the assurance involved with sustainability reporting, how do you see that practice evolving within your organization as the uptake of sustainability reporting accelerates? I think from my organization's perspective, clearly the, the demand or the increased recognition of the value of assurance will drive the need for our services <laughs> in terms of, um, and I think, I think that's a good thing for the marketplace. I think the role that traditional auditors play in the capital markets is one of instilling confidence and transparency and efficiency in the marketplace is, is that's assen essential to transparency. So I think, I think we, we will continue to see the focus and the uptake of assurance <coughs> at a moderated pace but again, I think it will track closely with and likely accelerate even more quickly um, as we're seeing reporting accelerate because it's, it's very fundamental. If, if you can't rely on the reporting, then of what value is it? Right, exactly. Credibility is key in this space. Yeah, thank you. All right, up next we have Gary Holzer. Gary is the Senior Managing Director and Global Sustainability Officer for Heinz. Uh, Gary, it, as, a as a member of the Office of Investments, responsible for various separate accounts investing in real estate in the United States and Canada, he is responsible for overseeing and coordinating Heinz's sustainability efforts worldwide. Uh, the sustainability report that you see on your chair here is, is Gary's making, you know, he led the development of that. So please feel free to take a look at that. It's a real life example of what a GRI report looks like. And with that, I'll hand it over to Gary. Sure, thanks. So I'm here as someone who takes all of what you just heard from Kristen and says, okay, how do we actually do this? How, how do we implement this at a firm? How do you get your internal stakeholders on board and decide that this has real value? And I'd point out that something you said that I think is really important, that proposition is very different in a private company versus a public company, from my point of view. So we're a privately held real estate company. I thought I'd tell you a little bit about us because the context in which you report is uh, will determine the kind of report you do. Um, so for example, a public company will disclose financials because they disclose financials anyway, whereas a private company may not want to disclose financials because they don't need to or have to. So you can see all of this in the report. So the idea of giving you out the report is not was really not intended for any marketing purposes, but so that you could actually hold the report in your hand, see what one looks like, see what, yeah, as an example of one, because we're talking about sustainability reporting and you ought to just kind of see. These reports are serious reports for serious readers. They're long, and if you want them to be something meaningful or GRI compliant, for example, they, there needs to be a lot of content in them. You have to cover a lot of, a lot of ground. Uh, to get to be able to be certified. So Heinz is a global organization. We operate in uh, 120 cities and 18 countries, 3,500 employees, or a big vertically integrated company. So we develop, we manage, we lease, we, we buy, we sell, we kind of do all of, all of it. And so in that context, uh, that context is really what drove us to do the report what we concluded was that our sustainability program was a collection of activities that were happening all over Heinz. And we needed to pull them together in one place and tell the story of what sustainability means at Heinz because it's the operating engineer in Barcelona and it's the property manager in San Francisco and it's the development manager in Beijing and they're all doing sustainable things and good sustainable practices but it wasn't in one place to tell the story. So you can flip to this in the book uh, and, and see that. We, we have a commitment to green certifications. We have 390 green certified buildings. Um, certification has sort of become pro forma now. I think it's a placeholder for class A. Um, it's sort of an, an expectation, so which sort of leads you to the next question of what's next. If, if you know, as you walk down California Street, if every building has a lead label on it, that's terrific. That's real progress. But what, what's next? We uh, really, we can't do it without our employees. We're very employee focused. In fact, our next report that Adam Seifman, who's my colleague here, and I are working on is going to be completely employee focused because 
it really is a collection of efforts of people. And as real estate professionals, virtually all of us, whether you're an architect or an engineer or a consultant, you're really your assets are the minds of your people, the capability of your people, and a few tables and chairs and computers. Um, as part of this report, and this would be interesting to you, and I think could inform some questions you might ask us as a panel later, flip to the very back cover of the report, if you would. And open up that back cover, and you'll see this. So um, we were interested in knowing what other stakeholders in the real estate space thought was next for sustainability in the built environment. So I interviewed 20 different people, culled it down a bit, took their conversations that ranged from me having to ask a lot of questions to my interview with Art Gensler. How many of you know Art Gensler? The head of the Gensler architecture firm is a terrific guy. And I picked up the phone and I said, Art, can I talk to you about what's next with sustainability in the built environment? And then I didn't speak for an hour. <laughs> um, and this kind of boils it down, and there are definitely some themes here. Uh, and one of the, I think, big and important themes is um, we need to spend a little less time making people that are really good at this better and spend more time making people who aren't good at it at all good. Um, and we, you know, we're constantly striving to go from, you know, lead silver to lead gold to lead platinum to squeeze out that last little point when for every, you know, Heinz and Shorenstein and Tishman and all the, you know, companies, the Googles that really care about this stuff, there are hundreds that are not doing enough. And mm -hmm. we, as a, we as a real estate community, as leaders in our, in our industry, have to try to figure out how to get those people under the tent. So why don't I stop there? Great. Thank you. Yeah, it's an extremely impressive report. Um, on that note, Heinz has been fairly successful integrating sustainability into its overall corporate culture. What do you think is driving that? What's the, the secret to success there? It was, it's Gerald Hines. Uh, he was, you know, Jerry Hines started the business in 1957. He was, a, he was an engineer by training, an HVAC engineer. The story, as the story goes, he's still involved in the company. He's 90 years old. He is, you know, he's just remarkable. Um, he, the story goes, he graduated from Purdue as, as an engineer, and his fraternity brothers were going to Houston, so he went to Houston, too, and he became an HVAC engineer, and then... He built his first little one-story building for Whirlpool, mm -hmm. and you know, the rest of it is is the story. Um, but we were tracking energy in our buildings since 1962 or 63, mm -hmm. um, and because Jerry just you know he was a child of the depression, and he realized you know a penny saved is a penny earned. If mm -hmm. we can run the building slightly cheaper, then that's a good thing. Right. Um, so it's so ingrained in the culture of the firm that. It, it wasn't a giant leap mm -hmm. to, um, to, to take. So, it, you know, in some ways he made it easier for us. I think the expansion of the definition of sustainability has been more of a sell. You know, the E part of ES and G is easy. Mm -hmm. Everybody gets that. Um, the S and the G part is, you know, how did that become part of, of uh, being green, you know, it's sort of, you have to kind of explain that. You probably see this all the time. Uh, but, you know, we've got a commitment to the communities we build. We really believe that when you place a building in a, in a city, it's going to be there for 100 years, and you better don't do that responsibly if you want to protect your reputation. So, um, I think it really just started with our founder. Fantastic, thank you. That's a really great segue into Dan as well, the additional... <laughs> metrics that go along with sustainability. Of course, environment is a massive portion of sustainability reporting, but we also look at things like social impact and financial impact. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dan. Um, we've heard first about the, the big picture and how all of this is coming together with various reporting systems. We've then learned from a, um, an, an operator, a developer, who's actually using the GRI system to produce sustainability reports and communicate what they're doing internally so well to their audience. And now we're here from Dan Winters. Dan is with Gresby, and he has responsibility for furthering Gresby's international scope by engaging institutional investors throughout North America, establishing industry partnerships, and expanding Gresby's coverage amongst REITs and private equity firms. 
depending on where you are in the world, some people say Grizz. My European colleagues, they always correct me. So, <laughs> if you hear that, it's the same rating system. Uh, Grizzby is an institution, an industry-driven organization committed to assessing sustainability performance of real estate portfolios around the globe. Institutional investors use this dynamic benchmark to engage with their investment management teams, aiming to improve the sustainability performance of their investment portfolios and the global property sector at large. So, Dan, with that. So, Grisb is a European company based in Amsterdam. If I use the word Grisby, I get a five euro fine. Fortunately, I've got the, 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 the exchange rate. Please don't tell that to my company. No, I'm on film. I'm on, this is great. And, right. So, so uh, I must say Grisb, and you will hear me, uh, and so we will all practice this at the end, Grisb. <laughs> so, I want to talk about uh, just really high level what is Grisb? Uh, well, you know, who is it for? And then I, I, I've got a couple slides on what the impacts are, so something that I find to be particularly interesting. So Grez measures from a portfolio level on down to the asset level the ESG factors of a, uh, of a portfolio. It could be a private equity fund or it could be a listed company. Um, the idea is that there's one consistent approach regardless of how your corporation is structured or how the, the, the investment vehicle is structured. And it's used by investors to scrutinize uh, their portfolio and engage with investment managers. So it basically creates a conversation on ESG metrics. Gresb is a survey. We'll talk about this in a, in a second. And it goes out and, and on April 1st, we're going to be opening up uh, the 2015 survey. And it's a three-month uh, window for companies to respond. Uh, and so when companies do respond, what they have the opportunity to do is say, here's the best practices that we are implementing, right? And Gary teed it up so well. Heinz has this baked into its DNA. Heinz would do very, very well on the GRESP survey. And it allows companies to look at themselves in comparison to others that are like them. So if you have an office investment fund, you can compare yourself to other office investment funds and, and, and understand where you are. So I've got some graphs on that. Uh, but importantly, I want to talk about the mission, right? The mission of Grez is to enhance and protect the shareholder value, right? So we're here for the investors, and, and Jackson lined this up uh, very well, where he's got, you know, the, the different perspectives. So I bring the investor perspective, and investors care a lot about this information. So from a Grez standpoint, some metrics, we've got 46 major institutional investors who are our members, and they are the ones that are very interested in this information from REITs and private equity funds to say, what are your ESG practices? Are you in, uh, uh, integrating best practices into your investment approach? And so there's uh, you know, $5.5 trillion of investment capital that represent, is represented by these investors. Uh, the survey touches, it's answered by 637 companies throughout the globe. Uh, those companies represent $2.1 trillion and it covers roughly 56,000 assets that are out there. So these are just some logos to give you an idea of who the investor members are. Uh, it's, when, you, when I look at this, and, and so you know, my, my job here is to really engage with the North Americans because this has been a European and Asian driven phenomenon. It really started with the Dutch pension funds. And there are several <laughs> big institutional members here in the United States, Texas Teachers and one of the large consultants, Townsend Group. Um, but, but, you know, some, some very significant folks here, C.D. Richard Ellis and Conan Steers from the REIT side here in the U.S. And then on the company and fund manager member side, I mean, that's kind of the who's who of uh, institutional investors. So this is, uh, Gresb was started in 2009. It's become, a, uh, uh, I'd say, a very important part of moving the conversation forward on ESG. So the objectives, there's four key objectives with Grez. We want to create some actual, actionable transparency for investors. Uh, the idea is portfolio level ESG, you know, from here on down into the assets. Comparative analysis and communications to allow the respondents to say, hey, we're here, all of our other peers are over here, we're implementing all of these best practices, um, and that's why you should choose us as, as a investment manager for your dollars. And then obviously our mission is shareholder and stakeholder value. The survey touches on seven different aspects. And then there's one optional aspect to the extent that a fund or a REIT is in, uh, uh, engaged in new construction. So it gives you an idea of, of sort of the thematic questions that are asked. So I'm going to flip through these slides and just you're going to see them move. And then I'm going to go back and we're going to do it again. So this is 2011. 
of the survey respondents. And to me, when I look at this, it looks like uh, taking a paint can and throwing it at a screen, right? Scattershot all over the place. The idea is management and policy, implementation and measurement. So typically in 2011, when you get this survey for the first time, you're like, whoa, look at all these questions. 46 questions is taking a long time. We need to hire somebody to come help us. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so this, is, this is what those results look like. Okay, so watch. 2012, grouping. 2013, moving. 2014, it's pretty interesting. Let's do that again. Hmm. So 2011 was, huh, look at all these questions I'm being asked. Maybe, perhaps, we should implement some policies. Figure out what our management processes are internally. So the next year they get the survey. Seems like uh, some impacts are happening with a lot of respondents. It starts to move up. And you know, people want to be here. They want to be the green stars, right? This is, I'm doing really well in policy and I'm doing really well in measurement and implementation. More people taking the survey, more movement, and then a big push over into the implementation and measurement side. So I look at this, I see a lot of progress. Here's what that looks like, you know, together. Um, and, and so it's, it's been very helpful to moving the industry forward. We're here for the investors. And uh, to the extent that uh, this really becomes uh, part of the investment conversation, I think that's a very positive thing. So with that, I'll uh, take your question. Great, thank you. It's really exciting to see the positive development that Grez is having. Notice I said Grez. Thank you. I'm going to take my five euro back. Um, yeah, it, it really is. Because it, it, it's not just a reporting system. It's a continuous improvement system. So. Given this past trajectory, what do you see the outlook um, for not only the survey and the reporting system, but the adoption in the next five years? So the survey this year has been held uh, constant. And the idea is to give people the opportunity to look at what they did last year, to answer the same questions this year. And then there are some additional questions in there that we call pilot questions. So that will help it continue to move and change over time. I see the big opportunity, quite honestly, in North America, because when I look at the respondents and I look at the investor base, it's been a phenomenon that's been driven by the EU and the Asian markets. So getting more uh, uptake here in the US uh, is, is certainly where I see the growth, and uh, you know I see a lot of blue ocean and fertile ground to make that happen. Great, thank you, Dan. All right, next up is Helen Garfield. <laughs> and from Helen, we're going to hear about two things. One, how do you rally a disparate group of organizations together toward a common goal? And also, how do you implement software systems to measure and track the performance indicators you need to report on the majority of these uh, surveys and reporting systems we've been talking about today? So Helen is the executive director of the Urban Land Institute Green Print Center for Building Performance. Green Print is an alliance of leading real estate owners, investors, and strategic partners committed to improving the environmental performance of the global real estate industry through measurement, benchmarking, and knowledge sharing. As the executive director, she is responsible for the overall management and growth for, of the center. So with that, I'll leave it to Helen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So Kristen mentioned um, something that was really important, I think, to the founding fathers of, of Greenprint, which is you can't really manage what you don't measure. And um, Greenprint was really founded on those type, on that type of philosophy. Um, so I, I, like, I always like to tell the story of how it was founded because I always find it interesting. Prompted by an investor, um, a group of really forward-thinking real estate presidents and CEOs, um, large portfolio owners, all took a trip to Greenland. They watched the ice caps melt. They felt this very strong call to action. They took a jet plane, apparently, to Greenland to watch the ice caps melt, which, which <laughs> sometimes don't hear that part of the story. But, um, so, but, but they all sat together for many days trying to really figure out how do we improve the environmental performance of our properties? And as an adjunct, how do we improve the environmental performance of the larger real estate industry? And when they started really examining how to do this, they said, well, we really can't take the first step until we understand how we're performing. And so they originally just started benchmarking against each other. They started collecting data on individual property performance and benchmarking against one another, benchmarking within their portfolios <coughs> on a localized level. And that's how Greenprint really, the birth of Greenprint about five and a half years ago. 
So we are, um, we are as, as you mentioned, a consortium of global real estate owners. We are 36 proud now, and I'll show you a, a few of them. Um, and really the mission is not only to, to really understand the performance and improve import performance, but really to figure out carbon, um, carbon reducing strategies that create value for the portfolio and create value for your properties. So these are our, our lovely members who really contribute their time and effort to really lead the work that we do. So we don't do anything in a bubble. We really consult with all of our members on probably a daily basis to say, what are you interested in capturing? How are you interested in improving your portfolio? How can we help you do this? And so since, since um, we've been founded in 2009, uh, we've been able to establish this environmental management platform for them to use. And so what we do is we track energy, water, waste, carbon emissions, certifications, projects, and literally we are doing development work every single day because the industry is really moving forward every single day. So um, we hope to really provide them with a platform that they can use to not only track their performance, but really help them improve their performance. So we, we capture their, their energy, waste, water, refrigerant information. We do a variety of validations and checks to figure out if they're plausible. We get back to them to say, are you sure this is the right data? You know, it, does, it seems a little bit out of line, and we work with them to improve it. Some of that is very um, is, is implemented already in the system, technically. Some of it is a lot of the work that our team does. And then, of course, getting to the reporting piece. Since we have all this data, we're able to help them do a lot of reporting, whether it be for GRI or CDP or Gresby. Uh, so for about 80 or so funds last year, we helped our members respond to the energy portion or the environmental portion, excuse me, of Gresby. Um, and so, and then we get to the analytics to so take, that, take that data, and now you're able to benchmark Energy Star's fantastic US-wide program, and now using green print data, you're able to do benchmarking at the very localized level. To say, you know, we have, for example, 260 buildings in San Francisco. I want to see buildings that were built uh, of this age stock that are this large in the office sector, and then you're going to actually see how your building is performing, and all of that is, is online. Um, and so, since we, we have the data, we're able to then do a variety of other things. And so, for example, one of them is looking at how environmental performance ties the, to financial performance, or really figuring out what those best practices are that our members are improving their performance of their properties. We often reach out to them and say, how are you doing this? Or we also have a projects module that captures how they're doing this. And we're able to bring best practices and case studies to the larger real estate community. So. Um, with that, you know, I just want to bring up one point. There's so many global standards out there today, um, and so one of our one of our members, they recently we recently went through a process of reporting last year, and he said, you know, it ha something has to give because he said, well, my, for this fund specific fund that he was doing, he said, I have 28 pages of financial reporting. I have 108 pages for sustainability reporting. Mm -hmm. And so the time that a lot of these sustainability, and I hear this every single day, the time that sustainability directors are spending on reporting is disproportionate to the time that they're spending on actually improving the properties. So there's something I feel needs to happen here. I'm not sure what, what it is, but I think as a community we can, we can figure it out. Thank you. Great, thank you. It's a great point, and um, one that's near and dear to my heart. I used to work for a product manufacturer, and I had the lovely job early in my career of responding to the 27 different surveys we would get from different owners and operators wanting information for their own sustainability reports. And um, it always boggled my mind why we could not streamline this process. So in that vein, do you think it would be helpful to streamline reporting? And if so, what are your predictions of how that can be done? Yeah, I, th I think it's a, I think it's a challenging um, a challenging question and challenging process for streamlining it. I think that I think by having by having a one platform where industry leaders can agree to what they want to capture. So I, I really like the program, for example, that SASB is doing, mm. right? Figuring out you know the 14 or 15 things, however many they end up with, that are material, right? Figuring out what mm -hmm. those are, we report on those, and then kind of if if organizations want to go beyond that, that's great. Um, but, I, but I think that having one set standard, I think, would be really helpful. Mm -hmm. yeah. So maybe we'll take a few questions here, and then we'll open it up for Q&A in the audience. Um, I think I would like to start on the performance improvement side. 
So, Helen, you did mention something very interesting about you know, people spending all of this time on reporting and not a lot of time on performance improvement. But earlier in your presentation, you talked about the um, work that you're doing to help organizations reduce their overall carbon impacts. So, can you talk a little bit about that as well? Sure. So, you know, so we have uh, we communicate at all levels of the of the organizations within our membership organizations. So. For example, the C-suite of um, a lot of these organizations would be on our board, and then we communicate to all the sustainability directors. And so if you get 30 or 20 sustainability directors in a room um, and are able to pick any, almost any topic to get them to convey uh, really in-depth knowledge um, on almost any topic you choose is, is really powerful. And we've been able to do that um, in larger groups. We'll, for example, we'll, several times a year we'll pick a topic We'll get speakers from within the within um, our green print community to come and address specific topics, whether it be reporting, whether it be solar roofs, or, or, or what have you. People that have actually done the projects, and they've done many of them, and they really are experts in the field. And if they're not, and if we don't have that within our community, and there's still really great interest, we get an external speaker to come in and kind of educate the group on this process. Um, and then what we also do is in much smaller communities, um, you know, for example, we had a new member last year. They were interested in 15-minute data interval um, data capture. He said, I've, I've interviewed eight companies, and I still have no idea who to select or how to do this. And so what we were able to do is, since we do have such a um, such just really wonderful companies that have really gone above and beyond in, in some of these areas, we were able to establish a small meeting for him to meet two other uh, portfolio managers who have actually done this type of work, and then he walked away from that meeting really understanding what kind of software he was looking for, what kind of hardware he was looking for, and really knew the direction that he was headed and really knew the results that he was trying to achieve. So, mm -hmm. so we try to do it both in the small groups and the larger groups. And then the other piece that we do is since we're capturing um, the projects, which is, is this is, um, so not only this is my energy consumption for the building or the meter, but we also capture uh, for example, a lighting project. This is what I thought this was going to cost me. This is what it ended up costing me. This is what I thought the environmental benefit was going to be. This is what the environmental benefit is. And we capture a variety of, of other questions in there to say, okay, well, where does the where does the benefit go to the tenant, to the owner? Um, you know, how do how do we measure and validate this information? And so while that type of information I think is really useful to the to the individual owner, I think in aggregate it's really useful to the industry, right? So when you can say you've done you know, 400 lighting projects, and it and it came out in a statistical level of certainty that the results were 95% within that correct range that you were anticipating. That creates more; it becomes less anecdotal and more serious in terms of I know I can go to my steering committee or investment committee and I can get these types of projects, similar types of projects approved within your own portfolios. And then I think that also adds um, on the financing side. You know, financing for these types of projects has been challenging for a variety of reasons. Um, but if we can make it more simple, right? If you can take out that some of that um, ambiguity or that uncertainty in terms of that, that this project will actually work, potentially more financing organizations come to the table and are able to underwrite these deals at a, that are you know, normally hard to underwrite because they're so little. Mm -hmm. Great. Does anyone else have any thoughts on that? How, how reporting improves performance overall? Because at the end of the day, reporting is, it, it, it's, it's an excellent thing to do, but it's a means to an end, right? Ultimately, we want to reduce our footprints, improve our portfolios, and improve our, our environmental and financial standing for our investors. I've got a quick interesting story, if I may. Hmm? Okay. Um, and it kind of goes back to the graphic that I was showing. Uh, there's a large REIT in, in my mind that I met with in, in January, and they started with this, uh, this the GRESD survey, and they were, you know, first couple steps on, on this journey. Well, last January, this is their fourth year having gone through this, and they were terribly excited and saying things like, we now have these management processes in place, we're doing 15 minute intervals, we've benchmarked in, in Energy Star, uh, uh, in Energy Star, all of our buildings, and you, you brought us down this path. And they were eager to join as, as members and, and uh, continue on, on this road. So. To me, that's very gratifying because you can see it over time. You get this thing, it's like, okay, right? They don't have it baked into their DNA. But now, after four years, it is. It's getting there. So, you, you're going to say something? Yeah, I, th I think an organ for us and for others, I think, you have to decide how introspective you want to be about your own organization when you make a decision to launch a report. 
because it's going to teach you what you are, but it's also going to teach you what you aren't. Mm -hmm. um, and for us, when I sold this to our executive committee, is it's important for us to know what we're good at, and it's important for us to know what we're not good at. And if we're not good at something, it needs to be a conscious choice. We are choosing as a business not to focus our attention on this matter, not an oversight. Um, so, as you, whatever scheme you pick, and uh, there are there are too many schemes, and they're going to all strangle each other pretty soon. Um, whatever scheme you pick or schemes you pick, pick the one that's right for your organization because they're different um, in meaningful ways. You know, GRISP is different than GRI in meaningful ways. Um, pick the one that's right for you. Understand what that the results from that will be and then get senior level buy-in to make sure the organization is really ready to be introspective about this topic. Because it digs pretty deep. Um, GRI digs pretty deep into your organization. It makes you look at a lot of things that you do, how you do it, why you do it, from the diversity <coughs> of your workforce to how you're tracking energy. It's all a part of this. And Gresb does the same thing. So you know, that's the advi I guess that's the advice I would give you if you're going to launch this. Um, be serious about it. Um, otherwise, it feels like a marketing piece, and pick the right scheme that kind of fits your culture. It's a great point. Talking about how do you get started, and Krista, I'm sure you deal with this every day with the companies that you're working with. Get the phone call saying, "Okay, I'm getting a question about a reporting system. How do I actually get started in doing this?" So, what's your advice for organizations who are at the beginning of this process? Sure, and I think it picks up on some of the comments that were just made in terms of what, what you choose to report and, and really what's your motivation. And I think one of the challenges in the U.S. marketplace, and this is going to be kind of a broad statement, clearly applicable to, to real estate, but this concept that, that this is all voluntary, which in large part it is in terms of formal reporting, but this perception that that voluntarily disclosing information around some of that stuff that perhaps you aren't required to in other manners um, is purely just voluntary in nature and exposing you to more risk, even if you're not a public company. And so I think where we're, we're seeing the shift in the marketplace is this recognition that once you start reporting, whatever your motivation is, I would say the largest driver of, of work for us in terms of companies calling and saying, come help us, our shareholder resolutions. Prepare a GRI report. What's a GRI report? Where do I begin? Mm -hmm. And and I think you know there's there's a lot of this this whole concept of this is just something nice to have. It's going to cost me money, and I this is not my priority right here right now. But once companies actually get into it and recognize it's a continuous improvement journey. You don't have to get to a G4 report in year one, and actually it would be shocking if you could, mm -hmm. that you start and you start to realize the cost reduction that, mm -hmm. that's possible, the risk mitigation, the revenue enhancement, really just thinking about the fundamentals of business once you actually get into this, the whole premise of sustainability, non-financial reporting. There's a tremendous amount of opportunity that's realized almost immediately. So I would say when we work with companies, it's, Clearly, GRI is a framework that helps guide an organization through the steps in terms of how do you even define what you're going to report on, this whole materiality concept, right? It goes through a disciplined process of defining the content. Who are your stakeholders? You know, in a, in a very disciplined manner around, we're probably talking to stakeholders, but are we doing it in a manner that, that actually is systematic and, and disciplined? so that we can generate a report that is something that we continuously update. And so I think GRI serves and has served the market well in terms of advancing standardization of reporting. I think where we're seeing just this convergence of the alphabet soup is what many believe is where GRI has, has failed to really accelerate drastically reporting in the U.S. It, 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 the, the discussion starts around industry-specific uh, information. So the, the, the baseline standard of these 10 indicators that you just know you have to report, I, I think it's going to be a long time before we get there, but I would just say that, that all of these initiatives just on the landscape are really <coughs> trying to, to bring attention to what are the important issues, how do they truly you know, inter, intersect and, and um, drive value, 
and how can that be something that helps an organization build that case and reinforce that case? Does everybody know what we mean by materiality when we talk about that? If I gave you an example, would it help? Yeah. So, for example, um, if you were a German doctor's <laughs> pension fund that was investing in real estate, something that might be material for you is how do we get basic drugs to, uh, the S in the ESG might be, how do we get basic drugs to you know, poor countries that you know, our doctors serve? That, that might be on their mind, as something material to them. It certainly wouldn't be on the mind of a real estate company in the US. We might be, you know, how do we build a building that takes into account the community in which the building is located? How do we build a facade that uh, is consistent with the historic nature of the community? How do we place public art? How do our people give back to the community that they're taking so much from? How do we mitigate groundwater loss? Those kinds of things. So I think the new survey is interesting in that it, it forces you through a set of a framework, like you said, that, that allows you to say, OK, this, this item is sort of not material for me. It's really much more material for someone who manufactures cereal in Battle Creek, Michigan. And this is right for Heinz that's building a building in Barcelona but might not be right for Heinz is building a building in San Francisco. And those mate that materiality, I think, is, is really helping allow people to adapt the report in a way that's meaningful to them and meaningful to their stakeholders. The other thing I would say about adoption of reports is, I say this a lot, if you want to know where sustainability reporting is, just follow the money. And, um, I think, for me, my opinion is that the leap forward in sustainability reporting is coming from the investors. Um, ten years ago, if you got an RFP to, you know, for, from an investor for a separate account or a commingled fund or, 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 um, you know, a club, you would have no. There would be no sustainability questions on it. There is not a single RFP that comes from a major institutional investor now that doesn't have. 10, 12, 15, 20 questions about sustainability and your company's practices in that area. And it ranges from, you know, how do you report energy to how transparent are you about decision making, how can employees complain about the practices of their company, what are your ethics procedures, all those kinds of things all falling under the topic of sustainability. Mm -hmm. I think you probably see that all the time. And this is for private companies as well as public. Public just have these built-in disclosures they have to kind of do anyway, whereas private companies don't. And it really has become a placeholder for Class A standard for a lot of, it, you just can't be seen by some institutional investors as a Class A operator without some meaningful action toward sustainability, in my view. Can I ask a follow-up question to that? Sure. As a private company, what motivated you to report against GRI, to report in accordance with GRI? Um, we, well, we looked at a lot of different frameworks, um, and we decided that GRI, well, first of all, we're a global company, so we needed something that had global recognition. GRI has global recognition. We surveyed, a I, when I became a sustainability officer, I went out and interviewed 20 different, 25 different investors uh, to talk to them about what they would need from us. Um, and GRI just seemed to fit our, the nature of our organization a little bit better than, than others. Um, you know, we were already doing all the sort of certifications at the building level. GRI just seemed to be the most sensible, logical, well-established, well-recognized. Um, and the brands that were kind of reporting to GRI, we felt was the crowd we wanted to keep. I'm glad you brought the, um, the point up about materiality. Because, again, it's one thing to have a sustainability report or re respond to a survey, but the materiality component really allows you to understand what's important to your business and incorporate that into your core strategy. And that's really when we see sustainability succeed within organizations and see the most value from the development of a report or a sustainability program because you're actually embedding it into the operational strategy of the organization. 
Can I add a couple more things because before the crowd breaks up? Because I want to. So just, I want to open it up for questions. I, um, I just want to tell you what it would cost you to do a report because that's probably something that's on people's mind. How much does this cost? What does it take to do this? Um, it takes a lot of time, a lot of staff time. So it takes us four months of staff time in various parts of the organization to gather the data necessary to produce the report. And data gathering is the hardest part of the report, especially internationally. It is much easier we've found to da gather, gather data in the US than it is to, to gather data outside the US. It's just not culturally embedded in some of these cities we operate in. Mm. You know, Paris and London meters, you know, meter, no meters. Some countries see it as some countries see it as private material that the tenants don't have to disclose and don't disclose, so that is really tough. You could get you probably could, you know, a report for a medium sized company, you know, you should expect with staff time it to, to cost you, you know, up to a hundred thousand dollars to produce a really substantial, meaningful report. So you know, this is not for the faint of heart. It's something that you need serious executive level <laughs> commitment to do. And the serious executive level, and you probably, you probably see this all the time, mm -hmm. serious executive level people tell the people in the organization, you're going to do this, you can attribute quality data to the report. Yeah, yeah what we've also seen that? is that implementation <laughs> of platform, software platforms, help with that data collection and reporting and streamline that and reduce cost. Yeah. So on the one hand, yes, it, it is a little bit expensive to get started, but once you have that process in place and you're able to track that with software programs, it's much easier to report year after year and compare your benchmarks. Yeah. You know, with that, I'd like to understand a little bit more on the cost side, what are you seeing from your clients and, and those folks that are using Grez? Are they, are they saying, no, this is too expensive to do, or is there pretty wide adoption? Well, I would agree with Gary that the big issue is getting the data, right? Trying to wrap your arms around the data, particularly if you have, um, you know, a portfolio that is triple at least, or uh, has the split incentives where your clients are, or your tenants, excuse me, are paying uh, the utility bills. So that's, you know, one of the challenges. What Gresb likes to do is say, are you uh, sort of directionally correct, and are you implementing things like green leases and, and, and whatnot to take steps to get there. Um, we, we're in a position where we actually give the report, so we don't have to, you know, the, nobody has to produce the report. We will turn around and, and uh, share your answers with you and put it in context. So it, for us, it's really a data gathering. But I go back to the story that I mentioned before with the big REIT, where it's like, oh, this data gathering, it's a big pain, and how are we going to do this? We don't have the system set up, and then you show up four years later, and they're like, wow, this is great, because now we're doing this stuff, and we have all this data, and it's really impacted our business, and we're saving cost. So... You know, it's it's a step in a journey, and then by the time people get get down the road, they're uh, the I've seen people pretty happy with it. So let's open it up for questions. I think we have about ten minutes, twenty yeah, minutes left. Fifteen minutes left. Fifteen minutes left. All right. You were the first hand. <laughs> you were the second, so we'll start here. Um, Gary asked about what's next. We're getting to the point where lead is more or less part of our daily vernacular. Um, what do you see in terms of strategy and implementation for WELL and LBC and NZE status? Um, and I shouldn't say just labeling buildings because I think our labeling buildings is really focused a lot on some of the things that we should be doing now. Thankfully, many of us are. And so, is it is it net zero energy? And you know, we we did a net we did our first net zero energy building last year, and. Um, it's not without its challenges. And, you know, I think it all depends on how you define a net zero energy building. There are many definitions out there. But the key here is, is it, you know, is it leasable, commercially viable? You know, is, we, there are many net zero building ener energy buildings out there, but, you know, if they're, a, if they're a city's effort to build their library net zero versus, you know, a Shorenstein property is trying to build a commercially viable, leasable financeable building, that becomes more of a challenge. You know, I think we can move toward net zero. Um, it's not without its challenges. We don't think right now you probably can do a commercially viable net zero energy building without some government subsidy. Um, You're in one. Pardon me? You're in one. 
<laughs> yeah, but this it's is much a, smaller scale. Yeah. Well, it's a corporate. It's a single tenant corporate headquarters building. It's not, you know I'm talking about a multi tenant, fifty story net zero energy building. I, I think it's going to be really tough um, to do that. I also you know, and I'm not giving you more questions than I am not giving you answers. You know, I wonder if the path to the next step is kind of one building at a time. So while it's really terrific to produce a net zero energy building, when you think about the path being doing that one building at a time, it's, it just seems like a mountain that'll never get climbed. And I, I think we have to figure out how to do this on a zone or a, you know, a it's city or a scalable way. way mm -hmm. you know? So, um, and one of the biggest barriers to that is our current public utilities. You know, we, um, we've got all this infrastructure and we've got to figure out what to do with it. Uh, you know, the, the energy company, very few utilities allow you to spin the meter backwards. So if you're sending energy back to the grid, they either limit the amount you could spin the meter backwards or they tell you you can't at all. So it's pretty hard to get to net zero energy when you can't do that. Yeah, there's um, definitely an infrastructure challenge at play there. There is. Yeah. So, you know, I think that the we have to try to figure out how to bring the public utilities, which is going to cause communities to face sort of abandoned equipment and how do we deal with all of that. Uh, but when you think about the progress we made in 10 years, um, I wouldn't have thought five years ago we could do a net zero energy building, but, you know, we are. We're starting to. Okay. Thank you. Does anybody else have any thoughts on that or move on to other questions? I just think that, yes, it is hard to do a net zero, like um, having been in the en energy industry for a long time and dealing with those policies, like, like how can we possibly imagine that a, you know, 25-story building is, like, going to produce some amount of renewable energy, like virtual net metering and, and using some sort of warehouse across town to put, you know, a megawatt of solar on that you can, in essence, buy energy. That makes sense because they're only using 100 kilowatts inside, so awesome solution but like you said policy is just really hard to get around and common sense um, is not a priority mm. <laughs> <laughs> very good point if we could get biofuel to every building we could you know we could run fuel cells and use biofuel and create lots of net zero energy buildings so we the new twitter head on how do we become net zero energy so i think charles you had a question as well uh, well, I have about a hundred questions, but uh, actually I'll just choose one, um, and I'll, I'll sort of pivot off of uh, Gary's comment about materiality, and recognize that this is a, uh, an, em an emerging field that's only about, well, you said ten years old, but basically six or so years old, that's providing information that potentially is being fed back to change behavior. Uh, but it's hard to get the data, and it's hard to feed the data back, and it's hard to get people to change behavior. I guess the question I have is, uh, in terms of materiality, one of the other factors that I'm, I didn't hear addressed uh, directly is uh, uh, a, uh, a factor that was just alluded to, and that is it takes more than just the company to create sustainable development. It takes basically action by the utility, by the community, by the land use planning. And in terms of uh, materiality of the, the community's sustainable development policies, where do you see this measurement device going in terms of creating a feedback mechanism for communities in terms of creating more friendly context for sustainable development? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. You know, I think LEED ND covers it a little bit, but you know, there are other survey systems that are starting to incorporate more broad brush community and infrastructure information. I think SASB actually has a, a subgroup that they're working on with for building and construction infrastructure, right? Can you speak a little yeah. bit about that? Yeah. Well, I guess, to your point, it's you're speaking to how do we start better measuring impact? And then how do, and I think this is an industry by industry, a bit, it varies by industry, right? There are certain industries that clearly are, are, are so tied to the infrastructure that enables them to operate their business model. I think 
what we've seen the standard setting initiatives and reporting initiatives to date have really helped to, uh, companies to think about the responsibility within their four walls mm -hmm. and with GRI, with the integrated, International Integrated Reporting Council, the Integrated Reporting Framework, and SASB, there is more of a focus on this, this. It's certainly the responsibility within your four walls, but your activities impact up your value chain and down your value chain. And I think that's the really hard stuff. That's the really hard, how do you standardize? How do you, how do you, you know, drive consistent behavior that then truly compels an organization to actually drive behavior change within how you even operate your business model? Mm -hmm. So I think it's a great point, and I think it's, it, it, it's an issue that varies by industry, but, you know, from my perspective, it's, it's kind of a, let's walk before we run. Like, if you think at, just as, as one proxy measure, not that it, it's, it's, you know, indicative of the entire marketplace, but within the U.S., of the 14,000 publicly listed companies, less than 300 prepare a formal GRI sustainability report. So again, I know I'm kind of diverting from your question, but just from a broader perspective that, that you know, within or across all sectors, there's such potential to, to, to accelerate just the disclosure around this information. That doesn't you start mean they're reporting. not sustainable. It just means exactly. they don't report. They're not exactly. Reporting, right? exactly. They could have a lot of issues and initiatives underway, but um, this whole idea that the transparency that will enable stakeholders to start further influencing behavior is, is absent there. Well, you know, not, well, no, you go ahead. And Charlie, you know, we were talking a little bit about this outside, and I think the other interesting part of your question is this disclosure of information on a citywide level, and what you know, what what's going to be done with all of that data? You know, increasingly, cities are requiring full disclosure on energy use and and other matters, and they're getting enormous amounts of data. In Particularly New, in the state of California, it's becoming well, and, and in New York City, norm, Bloomberg, yeah. Mayor Bloomberg funded that, and um, and there's a lot of discussion in the real estate community of okay, we're doing this. It takes an enormous amount of effort on our part to do it, and we do it because it's the law. Um, what are the cities doing with this data? Um, do they really understand the complexity of the data? Mm -hmm. Are they? Um, and you know, for us, we have this fear that data about real estate can get oversimplified, and every single building is different. It's different because of the occupancy. It's different because of the structure. It's different because of the city. Different because of the climate. I can just kind of go on and on and on, and it's pretty hard to paint broad generalizations about office buildings or schools or libraries or or warehouses. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we have to watch this, uh, not as necessarily because it's bad, but because it's unknown. And I think people are trying, you know, the ideal would be that, you know, like a probable maximum loss number, you know, when everybody, when somebody says that the building's at 10, everybody knows what that means in, earthqu in an earthquake zone. When somebody says it's at 22, everybody knows what that means in an earthquake zone. Could we ever get to the point where there's you know, a broadly recognized metric for how sustainable a building is. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the question of how sustainable the company is. And um, I, I, I want to turn it over to you, but a very smart guy at E.ON in, in Dusseldorf said simplified ESG to me once, and I, and I think it's the segue into, you know, where you look a lot at the company um, in, in Gresby, which is, you know, E is all about the building in his view, and S and G is all about the company. Um, and I think that is, I think it's a simple but very elegant way to think about the difficulty of how do you amalgamate all this information in a way that can be consumed pretty quickly and be meaningful to investors. So I want to take us back to, to the note, well, the, the fact that we live in a market economy, right? And markets... Uh, are, are based upon transparency that is actionable, that is reliable, right? So that was one of your initial points. And that, you know, markets rely on signals. The best signal that we have in our day-to-day -day is when we drive by the gas station, we see that price, right? That's a signal. Pricing is a signal. But there are all kinds of other signals out here. A lead plaque is a signal. An energy star score is a signal. What you get on your grids, how you're doing on green print, these are all signals. They're signals of best practices. They're signals of engagement. So to the extent that these can be, uh, uh, you know, they don't necessarily need to be boiled down into one number, but they do need to be attributed to value. And as markets can attribute value to these things, 
that then leads to communities wanting to do these things. So when I was in the Mayor's Task Force for the 2006 Green Building Act, one of the points that I was making was, look, if, if you do this and you have all these lead buildings starting to pop up, you reinforce that you are in a, a gateway market for international investment. So, you know, that, that's to me always how to bring it home. I'm always a market-oriented guy. Uh, I know this is a reporting uh, discussion, but let's not lose sight of that. That's, a, that's, that's important. Well, that's the way you sell it. That's the way you sell it to the C-suite. Helen has some thoughts as well. Yeah, right? Yeah, no, and I, I just wanted to, to kind of expand on that just a tiny bit. So, you know, we, we're we always looking, there's, so, there's I think about 50 reports out there today that are trying to link, you know, lead certification or some sort of certification or what works, some sort of um, rating tool to better financial performance. And so we've done a lot of this research too, but at the end of the day, I think it's really, you know, challenging to tease out um, how, how does sustainability equal a financial value. You can do it from the the bottoms up approach very easily. Yes, I saved a dollar in my in my expenses. That contributes to my NOI. That contributes to you know cap that at ten or whatever you cap it at. And here you go. Here you have additional value to your property. Um, but I think at the end of the day, to, to your to, to your point, I think what it's it's saying and what, what we see in our portfolio, we did some market research and we linked. For example, we linked. 177 buildings, uh, very detailed financial data, very detailed environmental performance data, and, and linked them together, tried to figure out if there were correlations. Very quickly we realized that it needed to be market specific. You can't compare a building in Idaho with a building in San Francisco. You know, that, that value totally changed. So, so then we, what we did is we looked at three specific cities, and we started looking at the cities, and of course, you know, the properties that we had that were reported into Greenprint, that were good performers in Greenprint, were performing, outperforming the other NACRI, the other, excuse me, uh, Nakery properties that we had in, in their portfolio. They're performing better, are they, because they're sustainable? I don't know, they're performing better in my view because the operators are these amazing companies that have stepped up, that they know they know how to operate their buildings well, they know when to change out their lobbies, they know, they know, what, they know what the market needs, and therefore the, the, the value of those properties are harder, or excuse me, are better, but it's really hard to tease out that, that performance, I think. But, but it is, it but is, it is an indicator, right? It's a leading yeah. indicator. So the ones that are doing it, doing it well, they're probably looking at, at all of their building information, right? Not only just the ESG. It's information. the holy grail. It's really hard. Yeah. So, so I, I'm going to step in and take the last question here, if that's all right. Go for it. And, and I want to build off of something that Gary started off with mentioning in his, his discussion earlier, which is there's that whole universe of buildings and companies that aren't on board with this yet. And that's where the, the opportunity is, right? Not taking the leaders and making them better, but taking the rest of the landscape and making that better. So, and, and I'm gonna put it to Helen first because you're here with ULI Green Print and this is a ULI event, so I'm gonna um, put you on the spot. What can ULI do and, and the members uh, of Green Print do to reach that audience who isn't in the room here. So ULI has a membership of about 35,000 people globally. And so what we've started doing through Greenprint um, most recently is taking some of the best practices and lessons learned that we, we have from our membership and trying to disseminate them in a larger, in a larger kind of audience. So we've had um, global webinars and we invite everybody to participate in those webinars to try to educate on, on any topic that could potentially lead to improved environmental performance. Um, also, we, we publish a, an annual report and this year we included seven case studies in that report, very simple case studies, but just demonstrating all the great work that some of our members are doing, whether it be you know, water improvements or uh, solar improvements or specific just operational improvements to your buildings. We tried to make them really broad um, and really accessible so that, that people that aren't necessarily doing this in their portfolios can actually take that first step and do them. Great. Thank you. Can, I, can, I, can I make one last comment about the San Francisco data? Um, so we one, all, last one last comment we're going to wrap up. But so and the, just really quickly, everybody's going to stick around for a few minutes. So if you have burning questions, everybody will be around to answer those after the panel is over. And there so are good. flyers to take yeah. away with you. Uh, to have those talking points when you go back and you can make the case for doing this uh, organization. Absolutely. So, so the, the, the question was, you know, we have all this benchmarking data, what are we going to do with it? And so the San Francisco government hasn't released their private 
city um, information, private building information. And so they're, they actually are going to release it to, to Greenprint and ULI. And we're going to be working with them closely over the next six months to produce it, um, a San Francisco report. That's great. Yeah. Fantastic. Have fun with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's a really high note to end on. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining tonight. Like I said, if you have questions, everybody's going to stick around for a few minutes. Feel free to, to pop up or outside and get a drink and, and have a chat. Um, and thank you again for coming. Thank you to Jackson for organizing the event. And thank you to our panelists for joining tonight. Yeah, very good.